let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we continue to open your word and to learn precious truths from it in these closing days of earth history, may our minds be focused to the work at hand. May we not become distracted by the cares and perplexities of this world, neither by the, the distracting annoyances, but may our hearts be turn to the work that you require of your people on the Day of Atonement. We should be searching our hearts, Father, afflicting our souls to see who and what we are and whether we are fit to stand in this day of testing. As we continue with our studies on the 2520, may we begin to gain a deeper understanding of its significance, the purpose of this prophecy to our individual lives and to us as a people. Bless us now to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Continuing with our study on the 2520, we moved on to Leviticus 26 in our last study and we, begin, we began to structure this chapter and to see if we could gain an understanding of the thoughts and ideas that the Lord is trying to teach us. If you recall... We had section 1, verses 1 to 2. And here this was an admonition from the Lord. And basically the Lord was saying not to make any idols, not to make any images, to keep the Sabbath holy and to reverence his sanctuary. All areas that he knew God's people would be tempted to break away from in the land of Canaan when they would enter into it. <clears throat> then from verses 3 to 13, the Lord describes to his people what he will do if they obey him and he pronounces a blessing upon them. However, if they choose to disobey, verses 14 to 17 describe the curses that will come upon his people. And we read a portion in our last presentation from Patriarchs and Prophets that described the history of the judges. This history was from Joshua to Samuel. And it describes the history of Israel during that time period. And we see that they did not obey the Lord. And, in fact, the Lord did curse them for this time period. And then we come to this interesting portion, which is relevant to our study of the 2520. From verses 18 to 20, 21 to 22, 23 to 26, 27 to 39 and then 40 to 46. And these four sections here 
describe this term seven times, which the pioneers understood to mean the 2520, as depicted on the 1843 chart here, and on the 1850 chart, right down in this bottom corner. But it's also depicted on the 1850 chart from the start date here at 677, ended in 1844, which is another representation of the 2520. So it's on both charts. <coughs> and the pioneer understanding was that this term seven times was referring to this period. And then there's a closing section, um, the final portion of that chapter from verse 40 to 46. <coughs> Before I deal with these, I just want to go to the last portion and just address this. So let's read from verse 40. The word says, If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbaths while she lieth desolate, desolate without them and they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity because even because they despised my judgments and because their soul abhorred my statutes and yet for all that when they be in the land of their enemies I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. <coughs> We can see here that God says, even though they have sinned against him and he's pronounced a curse upon them, at the end, he will restore his people. He will come back into covenant relationship with them. So he promises them, even though he punishes them, even though they will walk contrary to him, and he will walk contrary to them, and he will punish them, and he will humble them, yet he will come back at the end and come back into covenant relationship with his people. So let's deal with this portion of this chapter here. But before we do that, I just want to, as a, as a way of introduction, go forward to Daniel chapter 4. It's a passage we spoke about yesterday. If you recall, Uriah Smith, in his book, Daniel and the Revelation, <coughs> in the appendix, discusses this 2520 time prophecy, and he suggests that it is not a time prophecy, in fact, and that one of the arguments that he offers is that it's repeated four times in the book of Levit in the in the book of Leviticus, chapter twenty-six, and he attempts to, um, in a kind of half rhetorical, joking way, multiply this twenty-five twenty times four, and he got ten thousand and eighty years, and so he kind of says, this is obviously un and an untenable situation, and he uses that as part of the evidence that this four times or seven times occurs in chapter 26 cannot be correct. <coughs> so let's go to Daniel chapter 4, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Feel free to read it um, at your own leisure, but I do want to offer you some kind of structure to this chapter. <clears throat> so 
So in Daniel chapter 4, we can divide Daniel chapter 4 into four segments. So from verses 1 to 9, what you find here is that Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He tries to find out what the dream means. The magicians, astrologers, and Chaldeans are unable to tell him what the dream means, so he goes to Daniel. So here he has a dream. And then from verses 10 to 18, He begins to describe this dream. He says, Thus were, in from verse 10, Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. And he goes and explains what this dream is. So here he has a description of it. And then from verses 19 to 27, Daniel interprets the dream. And then in verse 19 it says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. And he goes on to describe the dream. <clears throat> then from verse 28, To 37, you have a description that the dream gets fulfilled. And Nebuchadnezzar actually goes through this experience where he goes mad and we're all familiar with the story. He's sent into the fields. Um, and at the end of that time, <clears throat> from verse 34, it says, And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. So the prophecy or the dream is fulfilled, um, and he is cursed, and then restored. <coughs> now in this structure of this chapter, a term is, is used, and it's the, it's the length of the punishment that Nebuchadnezzar receives because of his pride. So if we could turn to verse 27, Daniel says, this is the close of Daniel's interpretation. So Daniel's going to explain why this curse is going to be applied to, Dan, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. What I want to try and show you is that the structure of Daniel chapter 4 is very similar to the structure of Leviticus 26. And it's by gaining an understanding of how Daniel chapter 4 works, we can see how we should be applying the seven times of Leviticus 26. And so, when we looked here, it was from verses 14 to 17, if you recall, where they received this punishment. And then you get the description of these seven times. And so, in Daniel chapter 4, there is a term seven times. We've already discussed in our, previous in our previous study that this seven times in Daniel chapter 4 is not identical to the seven times of Leviticus 26, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. I'm trying to make this point here. In verse 16, in the description, so this is when Nebuchadnezzar is describing the dream to Daniel, this term, and I'll put it this way, I'll in... This term seven times pops up and it's in verse 16. 
and it says, Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. So there's a punishment that's inflicted upon Nebuchadnezzar, and then you have a duration for this punishment, seven times. <clears throat> that's in the description. Then in verse 23, so we're now in the interpretation phase of this chapter, 23 says, And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. So here, again, we see this term, seven times. Then in verse 25, this seven times occurs again. It says that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou shalt know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So here we see another seven times given. And then the last seven times is in verse 32, when this dream or prophecy is fulfilled. Verse 32 says, And they shall drive thee from men, and, do, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and give it to whomsoever he will. So I hope you can see that how these seven times in Daniel chapter 4 uh, is structured. Now when you read it, and I hope you've seen it already, is that this seven times is dealing with the same event. Nebuchadnezzar, because of his pride, is going to be punished. And this punishment is described as a single event. It's described in the description, twice in the interpretation, and once in the fulfilment of the, of the dream. But each time it's mentioned, it's always dealing with the same time frame, the same setting. And it's picking up the idea that we can get, a, get an understanding when we come to Leviticus 26, that in fact, the same thing is happening in this chapter. Now when most people come to Leviticus 26, and they see the curse here, or the punishment that's in 14 to 17, and then they go through this chapter sequentially, what they think that they see is that there's an increasing severity of punishment that's applied to God's people. And they read it this way, they say, God will punish them here, and if that's not enough punishment, then he'll punish them some more. And if that's not enough, he'll punish them some more. And if that's not enough, he'll punish them some more. And if that's not enough, he'll punish them some more. So they see this as this, a sequential increasing punishment. I don't believe that's a correct way of looking at the structure of Leviticus 26. What I believe God is trying to show us here is that God is going into covenant relationship with his people and he says, if you obey my word, I will bless you. If you don't, I will punish you, I will curse you. And then he describes what the punishment will be. And it's this punishment here. And then he, and this punishment ends before the nation of Israel even has a king before the Assyrians come on the scene and start provoking and start annoying his people. And he says, I will punish you for this time period. And in God's mind, his, his idea is that this should be sufficient punishment. But then he says this, he says, if this is not enough punishment, then I'm going to punish you for seven times for 2,520 years. And this is not a sequential punishment. It's not an increasing punishment. What it is, is that he says, if this is not enough punishment, then I'm going to give you this punishment. And so all these four punishments here are in fact one single event. They're a single punishment. And it describes various aspects of what this punishment is in a very similar way if you read from verse 14 to 17, it lists the different punishments that he will bring upon them. 
So just refreshing our minds, when we go to from verses 14 to 17, he says, just paraphrasing, if you disobey me and break my laws, my covenant, then I will punish you with disease, bad crops, and you'll be defeated by your enemies. And he says this, begins in, in verse 18, he says, and if you will not yet for all this, hearken unto me, then. So if this is not enough punishment, if they haven't learnt their lesson by this stage, then the punishment that's going to be inflicted upon God's people will be this seven times punishment. And the idea is not a sequential or an increasing punishment. It's, this is the first punishment, and if that's not enough, then there's going to be a second punishment. And the second punishment is how we understand this seven times punishment. And the structure is very similar to what you get in the book of Daniel. This seven times occurs four times, but it's dealing with the same event. And this seven times here occurs four times, but it's dealing with a response from God to say, if this is not enough punishment, then this is what's going to happen. And if, you, if we look at each of these sections, <clears throat> we'll see that they're dealing with four separate aspects of what this punishment in the time period of the 2520 will be. They're not dealing with a sequentially increasing punishment. So from verses 18 to 20, he talks about they will have bad harvests. Verses 21 and 22 says that he will allow wild beasts to come. And if you would like to turn to Exodus chapter 23, verse 29, that's Exodus 23, 29. <clears throat> God gives us some insight into this issue about the wild beasts. He says, I will not drive them, which are the Canaanites, out from before thee in one year. So this is before they enter into Canaan. And God says, when you enter into Canaan, I'm not going to have the land vacated all in one go. And then he explains why. He says, I will not drive them out from you from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. Obviously, the land of Canaan, before they enter it, is inhabited by the Canaanites and they manage the land, they control it, and they keep the population of wild beasts down. If God were to wipe away the, nation, the nations that resided in Canaan, the whole land would be before them. One issue that they would have would be that there would be no, not enough people to tend the land and then the wild beasts would grow up and they would have issues and problems with them. So the reference that's given in verse 21 and 22 is that the wild beasts will come upon the land and the inference is that there's not going to be anybody there to manage the land. It's going to be not populated as it should be. Verse 23 to 26 says, and if this punishment is still not enough, this punishment here, then there's going to be war, disease and hunger. So we have war, disease and hunger. And the last section says, If we read from 27 to 39, it talks about eating the flesh of the children, destroying idols, destroying the cities, scattering God's people among the nations so that the land will have a Sabbath rests, and those who are left in the land will be weak. So God says he will cause the people to eat their children, He will break their idols and their cities. And this is God will do all of this. He will scatter them. And the land shall have rest.
and if there are any people left in the land, they will be weak. So we can see that when the land shall have rest because the people are scattered, this is why the wild, wild beast will come, because there's no one who is managed in the land anymore. And if you read into these punishments, you'll see that all of this was fulfilled in the time period that is after the time period of the judges. It's not the time period that's dealt with in the period of the judges. So, in summary, the point that God is making here is he says, keep my covenant. If you do, I will bless you. If you don't, I will punish you. And they don't keep the covenant, so God punishes them during the time period of the judges. And he says then, that should be enough punishment. You should have learnt your lesson by that stage. But if you haven't learnt your lesson during this time period, then I'm going to offer you a more severe punishment. And this punishment is the 2520 punishment, the scattering. And it's not for, sequential, for sequential punishments. It's this is the punishment that will be applied if this punishment didn't work. It's dealing with one time period, one punishment. And it just shows you the breadth and the depth of the punishment that God brings upon his people. With that understanding, it, it gives you the ability to come into Leviticus 26 and to begin to make sense of what God is trying to teach us here. And it shows you the structure of of these, of these passages. So, I want to deal with another issue <clears throat> that's commonly brought up when dealing with Leviticus 26. And Uriah Smith brought up this very same issue. And we'll tackle that issue in our next study, but I just want to highlight it to you now. If you recall, and I'll quickly read the passage to you from Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith, in the appendix of his book, Daniel and the Revelation, says, But we need not borrow, sorry, but we need borrow no trouble on this score, for the expression seven times does not denote a period of duration, but is simply an adverb expressing degree and setting forth the severity of the judgment to be brought on Israel. If it denoted a period of time, a noun as its adjective would be used, as in Daniel 4.16, let seven times pass over him, and we've already dealt with that. Here we have the noun seven times, and the adjective seven, thus, Shiba Eden, but in the passages quoted from Leviticus 26, the words seven times are simply the adverb Sheba, which means sevenfold. And then he talks about the Septuagint, says essentially the same thing. So he makes a comparison here that when you look at Daniel chapter 4 and you have this term seven times, they're two separate words and this is a noun and this is an adjective. But when you come to Leviticus 26 and you have this term seven times, He says that this is one word and it's an adverb. And because of the difference between these two, he then infers that it's incorrect to call this a time prophecy when we call this a time prophecy. In our next study, I want to address this issue and to show you that even though there is this difference, we still, I believe, have license to use this term seven times in Leviticus 26 as a time prophecy. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we continue to open your word and to see the things revealed in them, help us, Lord, to spend time studying your word we know, Lord, that we should not take the word of any man, but we need to study for ourselves to see the things therein. May each of us, Lord, as Bereans, be faithful to that calling. Not only, Lord, that we might not become deceived, 
But Father, in the very process of opening your word and communion with you, our hearts and minds are changed. Lord, this is a process that cannot be transferred from one person to another. Each of us, Lord, must taste and see for himself who and what you are. May each of us, Father, put away the things that this earth has to offer in the closing moments of earth's history that we might make the necessary preparations for the time in which we're living. For each of us knows, Lord, that very soon the events that we have dreamed about will burst upon us, Father. And may it not be for us, Lord, as an overwhelming surprise, but may we be prepared for that moment and that hour. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.